Good evening, my fellow Riz Elite members. This is Chris with Riz International, and this is your weekly market recap. And we are joined tonight by the man whose name is on the side of the building. That's right. It's Riz. How are you doing tonight, buddy? Doing awesome. Thanks for having me, Chris. Oh, it's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to have you here. And I'm really excited because we've got a new part of the webinar that we're going to premiere tonight. So all of you who are here on the live call and who are watching the replay, you're in for a treat. So hang on for that. You're not going to want to miss it. But uh, we're going to start off with the way we usually do. We're going to take a look at the S&P 500 here. And, uh, you know, despite a little bit of stalling on Wednesday and Thursday, Friday was a pretty big green day, all things considered. We made a new all-time high on the S&P 500, and it just does not seem like anything can stop the market at this point. Now, uh, obviously, some recent news coming out here just uh, earlier today, from what I understand, was, uh, you know, former President Trump was acquitted on his impeachment. Now, I understand that the market sometimes is fickle and has this attitude of, well, what have you done for me lately? Uh, but Riz, my question is going into Tuesday, because everybody remember President's Day is Monday, so no trading in the market. Uh, do you think that this news story will act as a catalyst on the market, or do you think it's just going to be business as usual? Uh, I think it will be business as usual. I think, you know what, like, you know, politics aside, um, you know, this is this is something that I'm not surprised of. I mean, um, you know, we knew that, um, you know, the the second um, impeachment and especially this trial wasn't really going to um, probably go forward with the with the conviction because, um, you know, uh, we need a significant majority for, for these kind of things in the House uh, and, and Senate. Uh, so it wasn't going to it was you know, the odds were a long shot. And as we saw, they didn't have enough votes to to kind of claim that conviction. Uh, so, you know what? It does open up uh, a, a 2024 election run because uh, if uh, any president passed uh, or sitting is convicted of any, um, you know, impeachment is convicted uh, and, and charged, then they're not able to run again. Uh, and because President Trump, former President Trump, uh, didn't have two terms, so contrary to belief, he is allowed to run again because he didn't have two consecutive terms, right? So any any sitting president, as per the Constitution, is only allowed a maximum of two terms. Uh, so because former President Trump didn't do that, uh, he is able to run in 2024, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yeah, you know what? You know, it's, it, it is what it is. Again, markets... From a market standpoint, it's not a big deal. Uh, you know, four years later, we'll have to see how things go. It's not the end of the world. It's not bullish. It's not bearish either, right? So ultimately, the market is looking at current uh, catalysts in the future. And there have been less and less catalysts. Before it was, you know, the first round of stimulus. Then it was, you know, are we going to get any uh, st uh, stimulus? How much checks or uh, how much money are people going to get? Then it was, you know, the vaccine. And now, uh, then it was the presidency and the election. And now it's, you know, the 2021 year where we're in the middle of February almost. And we are still kind of, uh, we've gone through majority of those catalysts. And now it's just about how good the vaccine rollout remains to be. And the cases, uh, not just in America, but, but, but globally, uh, and, uh, of course, we have to still see what's going on with this uh, stimulus part 2.1, which is, you know, are we going to get $1,400 checks by we, I mean, the average American uh, person, not me specifically. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's another thing that the markets are waiting on. And of course, uh, what is in that final stimulus bill uh, will, will make a big difference. Absolutely. Still a lot of questions to be answered as far as the stimulus and things like that. And as we've seen in the past, that definitely has a an effect on the market and how people view, uh, you know, forward outlook, uh, you know, for the market and things like that. Absolutely. It definitely will, will be a catalyst Absolutely. for sure. And we can't we can't forget, you know, the central bank. Obviously, we can't forget, um, you know, the amount of money they've pumped in, the amount of uh uh, asset buying, not stocks, but they've bought bonds, corporate bonds, treasuries. They've done a lot of uh, uh, quantitative easing. I'm not going to get into what that means, but ultimately uh, they have backstopped the, the market. They have backstopped, um, in a way, the economy, right? Uh, so 
it, and, and you know the jury is out on if it's the right move or if it's good or bad. Uh, everyone wants to be handed money in a way, uh, but you know there has to be a certain limit. You know we can't do it. Um, I would say infinitely. So uh, we have to see, you know, with the new uh, Treasury Secretary being Janet Yellen, the former uh, uh, the former uh, Fed chair uh, before Jerome Powell. Uh, so she is a name that I and any other uh, market veterans know well. Uh, and uh, she's going to be the Treasury Secretary uh, to take place uh former president, uh, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin. So uh, this will be interesting how Janet Yellen plus, um, you know, current Fed chair Jerome Powell kind of work together. And, and, and we do know Jerome Powell, J. Powell, uh, the good old money printer, uh, you know, he's kept the machine going. So uh, we'll have to see how they kind of go. And he's already in a, in a re recent um hearing uh, of the Fed chair, he, he, he said, you know, he, he still thinks that we have a long way to go to full employment uh, before the whole coronavirus COVID-19 ordeal. So uh, he, he's pretty much saying that uh, he's open to pumping more. Well, we'll definitely have to keep an eye on that moving forward. Uh, that could definitely be a uh, something to watch out for, to say the least. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the breakdown for the S&P 500 here year to date. And uh, energy just steamrolling uh, right now. Huge, uh, you know, push towards the upside since the beginning of the year. Uh, and we will look at our overall one year, you know, 365 days back to get a bit more perspective on that. But since January 1, uh, energy really been the big winner, though. Uh, real estate, financials, and tech all hanging in there right around 8%. The S&P 500 itself is up almost 6.5%. Uh, and none of the indices right now are in the negative, which is, you know, definitely a positive thing. Uh, Riz, do you think that this movement in energy is more so based on the fact that we're getting more vaccine rollout and people think that we're going to be traveling more? Uh, you know, that's a great question. That's a great question. I think, uh, you know, I have been calling for, for oil equilibrium price per barrel around 60. We are getting there. <laughs> uh, yep. This is the energy sector, of course, but we will go on uh, on price per barrel shortly. But, you know, I'm not surprised the energy sector is doing well, continue to do well. Um, it, you know, I feel like $60 per barrel is still on the cards. It should be happening soon. And as you said, with travel, hopefully resuming with the world, hopefully getting back to some form of normalcy, um, you know, whether it's people moving, traveling, commuting, to a certain extent, the world will never be the same as it was uh, across many industries, as we've seen, but we can get some gradual rollout. And I think energy is something to keep an eye on, whether it's traditional oil, but natural gas, but also, of course, I've mentioned it before, clean energy is really, really big. We know the current administration is, you know, super bullish, not just bullish, but super bullish, super energy, clean energy focused. Um, and and they, they, they look to be continuing that, you know, throughout their next four years or wherever. Um, so, you know what? I think, you know, although I do not have any hardcore EV plays or hardcore solar or uh, clean energy plays currently, um, I have rolled back a bit of my um, traditional energy oil uh, holdings, you know, over the last uh, year, slowly but surely, because my positions are so large, I don't, you know, whether it most, you know, some of them you could say are probably around uh, two to $300,000. So each position, so it's not easy for me to just click a button and just completely roll out of them. So I do it gradually. And that's what I've been doing with energy recovering. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm going to see if there's if there's some room that I want to maybe move into other sectors. And, and overall, we can see uh, utilities and XLV, which is the healthcare um, pharmace pharmaceutical sector and healthcare is, is kind of lagging. And, and we will touch on that uh, in one of my uh, trade ideas for the coming week. Absolutely. So you mean you're telling me you don't just click the you know the market sell uh, button when you want to exit a position, Riz? Sorry, I mean, you're telling me you don't just put out a huge market order and just like let it all go? <laughs> no, I know you're joking, but yes, no, I don't. <laughs> I would move the price lower. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. That is a little joke. Uh, I mean, I'm fortunate to be able to say that. <laughs> For sure, you know, but. 
um, you know, uh, you know, hubris aside, uh, no, I would not be market selling, uh, you know, my position. Sorry, guys, a little market humor there. All right, let's just pull it out about a year here just to kind of take a look at where we've been over the past 365 days. Uh, and you can still see that, you know, even though energy over, you know, since the beginning of the year is up very nicely from the point where it was about a year ago, which is almost right when we started to see the rollover for coronavirus, still underperforming at this point. And so only now has financials been able to claw back to the zero mark for the most part. And, uh, you know, we still have some indices here that are still underperforming. Uh, one of these I have to be tell you that I'm a little surprised in is uh, real estate. I, I got to tell you, at least in my area, I know people who are looking to, you know, purchase a house and things like that. Uh, real estate is just flying off the shelves at this point. So, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that, Riz? Why is real estate still lagging so much? Yeah, so that's a great question. We've seen um, nationally uh, across the U.S. and even across where I am in Canada, housing has gone bonkers. Mm -hmm. uh, something that many people may not have thought of is with COVID, with COVID effectively changing the way we operate in businesses and even in our day to day lives. Uh, and I don't see it going back. To completely normal you know uh, and what do i mean by that i mean that many jobs have gone work from home uh and many will remain that way uh even after we've hopefully gone past all this uh, uh you know pandemic stuff so the world will never be the same you know we've seen we've seen movie theaters movie theaters are probably never going to be the same they might be a novelty thing you know we've seen um many many different industries absolutely turned upside down uh and although we're going to see people come back to work and work in offices and, 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 and you know, areas like that, but it's not going to be the same. So one of the biggest shakeups in real estate is twofold. One, we have residential. Let's look at residential. Residential meaning that housing, like you said, you know, for the average person, whether it's multifamily, multiplex, whether it's single uh, family, you know, whatever the whole point is, the entire residential sector, a part of, apart from, sorry, condos, has gone up. Why, you may be thinking. And this is across of North America, not just US. Why have condos dropped? The condos pricing have dropped because there's no reason for the average person now uh, to stay close to work because they're working from home. So what have people been doing? In fact, pricing in suburbs, pricing outside of direct city metropolitan areas have been skyrocketing where we've seen pricing in downtown areas, in metropolitan cities, in cluster zones is actually dropping, right? But on a notional value, real estate is increasing. But that is a caveat. Residential real estate is increasing. Commercial, on the other hand, is in the doldrums. And I think commercial real estate is uh, is a very, very uh, tricky one because the banks have a lot of exposure to commercial real estate. We know that if there was, um, you know, all these kind of restaurants is one thing, but if you have these crazy large uh, strip malls, you have these crazy large, uh, you know, real, uh, let's just say retail stores, whether it's, uh, you know, small little boutique outlet stores, they're not going to be as in, uh, I would say, form as they used to be, because guess what? People have flocked to moving towards buying online. They've gotten more comfortable with buying online. Um, you know, even the biggest holdout like me who avoided shopping on Amazon for the last, you know, uh, up until a year or two ago, uh, I too now never probably want to ever step into a store. Um, that's just, you know, because things have changed. So you, you know, you will see in your personal life, people that, you know, avoided buying online, avoided shopping online will probably, uh, you know, see, uh, adoption rates going up for for purchasing online, buying all kinds of things online, not just, you know, retail goods, but whether it's clothing, whether it's anything and everything. So we will see big box stores consolidate. We will see commercial real estate now turn into something where we're more so looking at distribution centers, warehousing. We're going to be looking at data centers. That kind of real estate area will go up. But traditional commercial real estate, which is big strip malls with huge you know plazas and huge stores well those we may be seeing as kind of like ghost malls right so it's something that we're gonna have to get used to and how these companies transition whether it's target whether it's walmart whether it's you know whatever so they're gonna maybe have to adjust and commercial real estate is a risk uh right now whether it's on the individual 
uh, level or whether it's on the massive institutional level because companies, large companies own a lot of commercial real estate and they are of course backed by the banks, right? As a result. So the banks have a lot of exposure to commercial real estate. And if we see uh, delinquency rates go up, if we see a lot of these places packing up and closing down their big box stores, guess what? You know, the landlords are going to be impacted. Uh, and that's why we're seeing the real estate sector not bounce back, even though one part of it is booming. Very good insight. And, you know, I have to say it's really true. I know a lot of, you know, brick and mortar stores around here uh, where I live in Indiana have closed and my housing, uh, you know, perceived value in my neighborhood has easily gone up almost uh, probably about 70 percent at this point. Wow. So, wow. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. All right. Well, we we're talking about oil and price per barrel and all those good things. And let's go ahead and take a look at that. So obviously the market gods have been respecting my trend line here. Uh, we'll have to see if that continues or not. Uh, but Rez was talking about $60 a barrel. And well, looky here, we closed just about 50 cents off $60 a barrel. Uh, quite the pop here on uh, Friday before the market closed. Uh, Riz, what's your take here on this really bullish move on oil? Yeah, yeah. You know what? This is uh, panned out pretty much. As I said, I have oil holding. I always have, uh, you know, uh, but I never did have direct correlation to price per barrel, right? Like I didn't hold a commodity itself. I didn't hold any ETF tracking it either. I have in the past, but not over the last uh, year uh, since last uh, you know, middle of last year when oil started coming back up. So ultimately, uh, $60 for me is is, is a reasonable level. Uh, I think we should hit it and probably kind of be able to float around it. Does this mean that next stop is 65, 70? I would kind of wait now. You know, I would kind of wait and see how the world is opening up and what the trajectory is on that before having uh, another upside target beyond $60 per share, uh, per barrel. Gotcha. Very, very good point. So, and uh, gold here really not doing all that much this week, uh, to be honest. Still just consolidating sideways for the most part, sticking in my channel here that I put down. Uh, and, you know, obviously gold is a, a safe haven asset with the market making, you know, newer and newer highs. Uh, do you see gold making any moves here anytime soon, or is it just going to kind of hang out here? Yeah, I, you know, I've been saying that for the last uh, few weeks now. I wouldn't be surprised if we continue to hang out here in the 1800 area. Uh, and, you know, your channel is very important. The sideways channel area is very important. I would not be surprised if we hit low 1800s, you know, maybe break a little bit below. But I would I would say this is kind of a normal area for gold. Perhaps one of the reasons that we haven't seen gold push up is, and we've touched on this before loosely, is inflation. Uh, gold is a good hedge towards inflation. Um and uncertainty. But as time has gone on, we have seen less uncertainty with the election being passed, uh, with vaccines coming out. So less uncertainty. Plus, inflation has actually remained pretty docile and pretty mute. And I know some people will say in pockets, well, Riz, you know, groceries in my area have gone up insanely. And Riz, you know, cost of living in my area has gone up a lot. And Riz, look at the housing prices, you know, that's gone up so much. So Yes, you know, I, I see it too uh, in my area, but on a broad scale, uh, inflation CPI uh, it has not, uh, which is a consumer price index, has not moved up uh, as as much as expected, especially with all the money printing going on, right? That was one of the biggest fears that, oh my God, the central bank's printing and printing and Jay Powell has been keeping the printer on 24-7. Well, he has, but we haven't seen that translate yet to uh, inflation, which is the erosion, which is the decreasing in value of any single dollar or any single currency, really. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that. As long as that continues to remain mute, oil, uh, gold will kind of languish. Uh, and if we see um, on the flip side, anytime this year, uh, we see inflation tick up positively, expect a rally and rise in gold once again. Okay, so it's something to keep an eye on. Absolutely. Something else that people have been keeping an eye on this week and have been chattering about, uh, as always, is Bitcoin. Let's go ahead and take a quick look, quick look at that. Uh, obviously, here is when uh, Elon made his announcement that he was going to be uh, buying some or investing in Bitcoin. Uh, and obviously, we've been saying for a while, uh, you know, 
the crypto is still nothing short of you know the wild west there's literally no regulation that's the way it was built uh but you know, Riz, what's your opinion on crypto at this point with this uh you know this huge push i mean do you still feel that it's uh you know being manipulated a little bit here or you know what are your thoughts on uh, um bitcoin and crypto in general yeah, I won't. I won't use the word manipulated, but you know what? There's a lot of hype around it. it continues mm-hmm. to be, of course. We knew this from even last year, where a lot of institutions have been getting into crypto uh, space, and that continues, right? That continues with even many of the payment processors like Visa, Mastercard, all having their own kind of push towards it. We've seen uh, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America. We've seen you know these large, one of the largest you know banks, even you know kind of adopt it and start moving towards it in terms of their own projects. Uh, And of course, with Tesla buying, I think it was $1.5 billion worth of Bitcoin. Um, Again, they announced it and and it went public, uh, you know, a few days ago, as you can highlight with that uh, candle, but that doesn't mean they bought it, you know, on that day. Uh, And I believe the cost for Tesla, don't quote me on it, is around 30, 35,000 or so per coin. Um, So, you know what? It's kind of had that uh, self-fulfilling prophecy where Tesla bought Bitcoin. They were obviously bullish on it and for whatever reason. And now it's even gone up further because of that news. And ultimately, let's see how it goes. I think, you know, there is no precedent for this. There is no precedent for this. Um, the last time, you know, we had crypto rally like this was in 2017. Uh, and people will say, well, look what happened after after the end of 2017. And that could very well happen. But there's no what the world was different three years ago than it is now. Right. So there's no guarantee that we see the exact kind of move uh, as we did at the end of 2017. For all we know, this could go to 50, 55, 60. I think there's going to be a point where people will eventually take some profits. There will be a push towards um, a lot of institutional adoption, which we've already continued to see. And that's one of the reasons why it's running. It's not just running because of mass retail inflow. It's running because of institutional money that has been coming in since last year. Um, so where is really the limit? I would not be surprised if we see large you know, financial institutions, any, any company uh, effectively using a certain part of their cash or certain part of their portfolios even to allocate towards crypto, uh, whether it's Bitcoin or, or, you know, Ethereum or or anything else, but they will probably allocate, you know, a couple percent at least towards crypto. And I think that's one of the kind of things that we've seen now, even with large ETFs, large mutual funds um, allocating some form to uh, crypto. Before we before we uh, kind of go into questions, everyone just um, hang in there. We will look at you know in this next segment, new segment of the webinar is three trade ideas, right? And of course, since I'm on here, I have brought some potential ideas for us to look at. And if you're in the elite membership, maybe you are already um, you know aware of some of them. I have mentioned them before, or maybe not and you're this is something that you want to maybe add to your watch list and keep an eye on remember these are trade ideas not something that you just have to go and simply buy uh first thing at market open right so keep that in mind the first one i have with us uh again i trade large caps keeping that in mind so pg proctor and gamble this one has been really moving lower and lower and lower and i'm not saying that you go out and buy it immediately on tuesday or whenever but something to keep an eye on. I think if we can get to the 125 level, that's a great entry, $125 per share. I feel like, of course, it's Procter & Gamble. They're not going anywhere. I don't have to say that again. You know, it's something that pretty much every one of us on this planet at some point are exposed to. We use one, if not more, of their products in some way. Um, so really, this is a phenomenal company, great company. Uh, I don't see it going anywhere. And everyone needs it everyone uses their their products and i feel like they are a bit beaten down right and once the rotation happens because as we saw as i mentioned before pharmaceuticals procter and gamble isn't a pharmaceutical per se but we have seen pharmaceuticals drop we have seen some very very solid consumer uh staple companies drop and this is one of them i think you know perhaps it can go a little bit lower but you cannot go wrong buying and holding this and being patient with it uh so that's idea number one 
the second one I have for us is another consumer staple. This is UL, Unilever. Okay, this is another large multinational conglomerate. This one actually looks quite good for a long setup already. Uh, as you can see, uh, bouncing off that 54 area, many people in the elite membership know this one. I have mentioned it. And in fact, some of them are already in it. So uh, a nice rally on Friday. And this looks good. Maybe can continue in the coming week. So put this on your watch list. Be aware of it. Maybe you want to enter. Again, this is not advice. This is not me telling you to buy. This is something that you need to decide if it fits your portfolio account and trading style. Last but not least, this is the third one. Again, a large, large company. This time, a retailer, a big box retailer, but one that has pretty much been immune to COVID. In fact, it's done amazing during COVID. And this one is Costco, all right? C-O-S-T is the ticker cost. And a great run since last year. It's done really well since last year, of course. But I feel like this is a good uh, entry level, especially as it gets near the 340 uh, area. Okay, the 340, 200 day moving average is a large support area. And this is something that I really like. Uh, even now, I would wait to see once the consolidation sideways breaks and once the momentum comes in. But this is a solid company that could pull out for a good long setup this week or even the next. All right. So they do have earnings coming up next month. Keep that in mind. And I do feel like they should do quite well. OK, they should do quite well. In fact, if I believe in the last few earnings, they have done um, uh, quite well as well. And of course, as I said, who would have thought? that Costco, a big box retailer, you know, the classic example of companies that should be negatively impacted during COVID, but are not because they're such a powerhouse. Costco, Walmart, they're big box retailers, big box companies, and, you know, huge, huge uh, commercial real estate uh, kind of renters. And they uh, are doing well. Why? Because they've also had a lot of the online purchasing a lot of online facilitation that they've adopted and moved with. And they're in a perfect place where Amazon isn't because Amazon needs storage. Places like Walmart and Costco, even though they're big box retailers, which people are not necessarily going to as much, their sales are up. Why? Because people are buying from them online. They've really kept pace with Amazon's kind of selling strategy and marketplace, along with the added benefit that they have of logistics plus the ability to house products. You know, they are effectively able to even house Amazon's goods. So keep that in mind, right? Maybe something we see out in the future where a lot of these companies may be partnering um, with Amazon and other, you know, even something with FedEx, UPS, they may partner with them and have, uh, you know, distribution centers uh, right from within their stores. Definitely some solid ideas here uh, for the coming week. Uh, definitely some tickers we'll want to keep our eye on moving forward here. Absolutely. Um, so without further ado, questions. Um, let's we'll, we'll take questions now. Again, thank you, everyone, for, for being here live with us. And um, we'll start with the, the first few questions. So uh, Rajiv says, I was looking at RH. All right, well, let's pull up RH so we can take a look at it. Question is, not sure how it can go from $70 to $500 in a year on $4 billion revenue per year. Can we walk <laughs> through the stock? Yeah, yeah. You know what? I concur, man. I've been watching this, and it just continues to keep going up. Uh, every time I think, okay, this is the top, uh, it keeps going. And luckily, I haven't obviously shorted it or anything like that, but I also haven't been buying because I just feel like this is it, you know, uh, and this is one of those companies that had a lot of uh, hype and has done really well uh, price wise and uh, even even during COVID. Uh, but I'm not I'm not a fan. And for these kind of companies, we have to understand there's a lot of institutional buyers, right? There's a lot of institutions that hold this stock and we don't want to chase it, uh, but we also don't want to want to bet against it. Right. So I would just kind of leave one of these things alone because man who knows where this can go this used to be if we zoom, if we zoom out further uh chris and take a look at where this was it's like it's crazy you know this thing was was you know had a massive drop of course in 2020 but even then you know it was 
it was it was kind of moving uh, slowly, uh, but since 2020, it's just kind of taken off. Uh, and like you said, on limited revenue. Okay, and I don't even think they make any profits yet. So, um, yeah, I something I'm just kind of keeping keeping away from. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so Simon wants us to take a look at MRK and everyone's favorite Pfizer. Let's take a look at Merck here. Yep. Another big pharma company. Yes, great company, amazing stock, right at that long term 75 area support, right? Look at that. Like it's 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 just you know, you can't make this stuff up. And ultimately, another company that I have been eyeing and I would probably be buying pretty soon, uh, just waiting for it to hold the 75 area which it looks like it wants to as of friday uh but i would like a little bit more confirmation before going long one thing you want to be mindful of is if you hold pfizer you hold a lot of large big pharma companies you don't want to overexpose yourself because if you've noticed majority of large pharma has been sold off, whether it's Merck, whether it's Pfizer, whether it's Sanofi, you know, whether it's GlaxoSmith and Klein, these, these pharmaceutical companies have been sold off. And for the one year they've done well, but this year, year to date, they haven't, right? So that sector is sold off. So you want to keep some, keep that in mind. Um, when buying these companies, don't be overexposed to them. But overall, you cannot go wrong with with something like Merck and even Pfizer. Uh, if we bring up the chart, this is another great company. Uh, of course, been in the news the last uh, few months a lot because of the vaccine, um, but it hasn't really benefited from uh, the positive catalyst. Um, and the way I look at it, even if we remove the vaccine stuff, even if we say that. Pfizer no longer sell any vaccines. Um, guess what? They still have a plethora of products that they were offering and will continue to offer even after that, right? They didn't have the best earnings, and that's why you see that the price is languishing. Um, but guess what? Where everyone else is kind of fearful or dumping it, that's where we can come in and buy up solid companies at great valuation. Can this go lower? Absolutely. You know, I'm not a fortune teller, but guess what? I'm willing to take the odds for something like Pfizer at $34.70 uh, a share. Definitely seems like a good entry. Uh, Hadi wants to know what technicals would you suggest to keep an eye on besides support and resistance and price action channels? Yeah. So, you know, I, I go over uh, a couple of indicators in my masterclass, stock trading masterclass. There's obviously the Alpha Cross Evo. Uh, there is Alpha Cross Evo indicator that I use. Chris doesn't have it on here uh, because, you know, these these uh, these charts and these webinars are usually often eventually made to the public. So uh, it's something that a lot of people won't be able to understand or interpret easily. So he doesn't keep it on a chart, but I have it on mine. Uh, it's an indicator I use. Obviously, the RSI is also on Chris's screen, a very well-known, well-used uh, indicator in, in, in trading. Uh, so that's something that you can also implement in your trading if you would like. Do you recommend holding ETFs in a portfolio? If yes, what is a good ETF to hold for five plus years? Yeah, great question. So uh, there are some um, dividend paying ETFs or dividend kings or dividend aristocrat ETFs. Um, there's, there's, you know, from Vanguard and, and every other ETF provider. Um, but really you can bring, Chris, bring up VNQ. I want to see if that's, so this is the real estate ETF. Again, it's done really well, uh, you know, since last year. And as you can see, it's kind of come back to where it was almost uh, as of last year, right? So this is a great ETF that you can hold. It's a very diversified ETF holding, remember, not just residential. They do have commercial real estate exposure. And as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, commercial is a bit dicey, right? So keep that in mind. Uh, there's, again, the ARC ETFs have been on fire. I'm not going to say go out and buy those because, frankly, they seem a bit too overdone uh, for my liking and overcrowded. Uh, but you know what? It really depends. If you want to have, uh, you know, exposure to the total markets, you know, you want to have exposure to this S&P 500, there's ETFs for that, right? So 
it depends what you want to do, what your thesis is, whether there's ETFs for oil, there's ETFs for pretty much everything under the sun. Um, so I, it depends on what your what your thesis is and what you are expecting, right? Personally, I don't hold any ETF right now. I do not hold VNQ. I have in the past, but not uh, since last year. Um, so uh, currently no ETF positions for me at this point, full disclosure. And guys, if you're going to try and hold an ETF long term, please stay away from the leveraged ETFs due to the uh, basically mathematical decay that they experience. Correct. Yes, Chris. Great, great point. Um, leveraged ETFs, you want to be very careful of holding for long term. OK, in short, if it's a leveraged ETM, ETF anytime, it's two times or more leveraged. You do not want to hold it for for longer than a few days, ideally, and absolutely not for months and months or more. Absolutely. Uh, do you also still recommend picking up Apple under one thirty one, or would now be a good time to get in? Yeah. So your time frame matters, but Apple is a great company. I would personally wait i do not have a position in it yet i'm waiting to see if it come down to 130 waiting to see if it comes to that area first right now it is as you can see moving a little bit sideways with a downward kind of curl uh and i would not be surprised if it continues but it depends on the market because the market is still holding and as chris mentioned on friday we hit pretty much new all-time highs um Apple has not been leading that charge, right? So as markets have rallied uh, the last uh, week or two, Apple has not done that. It's kind of been moving sideways the last week. So I wouldn't chase this. I wouldn't get into it right now. I would kind of wait and see. Uh, the moment you have a break in a certain direction after a period of consolidation, then that could be very bullish if it's on the upside or very bearish if it breaks lower. This one I like, uh, and th this is a really good talking point that I think you can expand on a little bit. Uh, Jorge, or George, uh, not exactly sure which pronunciation it would be, uh, says that BNGO has mentioned in their annual report that they are anticipating to continue to incur net losses in revenue, aka zero profits, for the foreseeable future. But the stock has been going up. What other fundamentals can drive a company? Let's take a look. Yeah, so this one has been going up not because of fundamentals, just pure play type of penny stock that has become crowded, very crowded, very hyped. OK, um, this is a genome stock. This is something that is a very, I would say, hot sector. OK, um, and, you know, whether it's different ETFs like ARK or whatnot that have really kind of brought these kind of companies to the center fold and, and brought a lot of attention when a stock gets a lot of attention. The fundamentals kind of go out the window. As you said, this company makes no money. They continue to incur net loss, right? Uh, and they probably won't see uh, profitability for the near future. And I mean, in the next few years at the very least, if ever. So why does it go up? Because of supply and demand. Simple. Fundamentals do not matter with these things. And usually you will be very hard pressed for me to buy or enter these kind of companies. I know people will say, yeah, but Riz, you know, I got in around six or eight and I say, great. Um, but it's just not my style, right? Because just like going to the gym, um, you know, people will do CrossFit, people will do cardio, people will do weightlifting, but not everyone's going to do every single one. And this isn't my style. So, you know, think of it like you have to do what kind of fits best. I wouldn't bet against this kind of thing. OK, don't get me wrong. I'm not a buyer, but I'm also not, um, you know, wanting to uh, implode myself. So I would not bet against stuff like this either, especially after Friday's candle, which is very bullish. Um, but, hey, these kind of companies do not need any excuse uh, fundamentally to go up. Yeah, guys, this is the thing that, you know, sometimes can be a little little deceiving when you have these things like, well, the company is not making money, they should be going down. It doesn't matter when hype is involved. Uh, you know, at that point, fundamentals are out the window. Yeah, especially in the near term, right? Uh, in the long term, I wouldn't be surprised if this thing comes back down, uh, right? Case you know, in Chris point. brought up, yeah, exactly, right, case in point. And it's just a matter of timing. The problem comes is getting the timing right, 
right with these things so anyone that can tell you they can do this consistently um well they're a liar and they're just probably uh getting very lucky or taking very very bold moves eventually uh that will run out and i don't know about you guys but i don't want to be stuck holding garbage um stocks it's good advice guys don't hold penny stock bs that uh very solid advice for portfolio growth. All right, Tala wants to know about ARKK. I'm not yeah. exactly sure what you want to know. You just put the ticker in a question mark. But uh, Riz, what are your thoughts on? <laughs> yeah, that? so this one, this one, um, again, we we've, we've talked about this in Elite, and of course, this is a, an ETF that is very well known amongst the trading, uh, especially the younger crowd. Uh, you know, Kathy Wood as being the principal uh, and, and kind of uh, CEO of Ark ETFs. And it's been on a tear. 2020 onwards has been great, but be careful buying into these kind of ETFs because they are very, very frothy. Um, Kathy and her team obviously do their due diligence and have their own mantra for what they buy. Uh, and I'm not going to discount that, but I'm telling you some of the stuff they buy um, is very, very, uh, let's just say, suspect in terms of, I don't know where they come up with some of their reasoning. You know, they buy things that they believe will just go up, up, and up. And it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. Because they buy it and because ARK is one of the ETFs that, you know, releases their what they're buying every day, that has a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, because they buy it and then they tell people that they bought it, everyone else buys it. You know, we've seen this with different stocks that ARK has bought. And I just feel like it's it's kind of setting up to be way, way too frothy for an ETF. Okay, and if for those of you that are paying attention, we'll also know ARK ETFs charges a decent um, uh, management fee as well. You know, when it comes to ETFs, because ARK is an active ETF, they charge higher management fees. Um, so it's something to be aware of. I don't think this is something that I would consider buying at this price point, um, because if there's a big pullback in tech, if there's a big pullback in the fancy industries that they um, that they buy it in. Well, guess what? This ETF will pull back, right? Uh, so I rather wait uh, and see as opposed to trying to chase this because be just because something has gone up, you know, from 40 to 150 in the last year doesn't mean it's going to go up from 150 to 300 this year. Okay. Something's got to give. <laughs> okay. Sorry, guys. I couldn't, re I couldn't resist. So yeah, just be careful with those guys. We'll see what's going on. Okay, uh, Gage wants to know uh, thoughts on short puts for RKT around 18 to 19 or best to wait for further continuation and more buyer pressure. Yeah, so this one I've been keeping on. I considered, uh, you know, short puts on this as well, especially around 18, 19. But there, it just, you'll notice that the premium for the near dated options, it just isn't there. Um, so you'd have to go quite a bit out and there's also earnings. So that's one of the reasons why I haven't gone to the further out expiries. So for now, I'm kind of waiting. This thing can probably, you know, go towards 20 uh, relatively quickly. I would not be surprised. And that's a good support area. Uh, so if you are looking to do short puts, 18, 19 is fine. Just be aware of the earnings catalyst coming up at the end of the month. And earnings can go either directions, guys. So just, yeah, definitely keep an eye on that for sure. If yeah. you're going to do something like that. An interesting company discovered this week is SENS. Well, let's take a look. Incense 3, uh, CEO used to work in Abbott technology, or technical operations, specifically in the diabetes treatment. I think it's a good play in the short term. What do you think? Yeah, very well. You know, I'm not too aware of this company. It's the first time I'm looking at it. Again, another company that was penny stock uh, it still is you know anything below three to five dollars i would say is is a penny stock and sure it can continue but uh you know keep in mind uh it comes down to your thesis because you know about the company because you know about the ceo you're obviously making uh, a calculated bet or you know decision based on that i can't make that same decision because that's not my thesis right so really this can go up, down, we don't know. It doesn't really matter. It comes down to your ability to kind of see it through. Uh, and if you have the ability to see it through with the thesis playing out or if it doesn't play out, right? So always, always ask yourself what your reasoning is, what your time frame is, 
and then go according to that um, and not simply according to what I or anyone else thinks. All right. Any thoughts on Neo? Seems to be a good hold. Yeah, this is a Chinese, uh, you know, pretty much considered to be one of the Tesla of the of China, right? And um, it's been on a huge, huge run, especially with the massive amount of hype for electric vehicles, clean energy, and positive upside. I think this can go. I mean, the fact that it hasn't dumped, uh, it could very well hold. You know, many analyst firms have been increasing their targets. Uh, I'm not a buyer at this point. Again, I'm not. I don't personally uh, buy. Again, without getting political or any kind of, you know, anything like that. Just personally, I have avoided buying any kind of hype plays, any um, Chinese kind of stocks as well, personally. So, you know, if it fits, absolutely, I think it can hold. Uh, just be aware that if this goes south, if this goes, you know, below 50, it could very well uh, continue to go lower. So these things all move based on momentum. These things all move based on potential uh for future growth and as hype goes up and down as you know it's like a pendulum right so be where be very careful what side of the pendulum you're on uh making sure you if you're able to extract money out of the market on both sides then great uh but if this goes lower below 50 then you might want to be a bit extra cautious okay do not be surprised if companies like this mean revert uh after a phenomenal rise you know from last june around five ten dollar area to to effectively five to six times gain. Quite a meteoric run on that, uh, to say the least. Uh, I think this is a good question to end it on, and we can uh, touch base on it. Uh, do you think any other institutions are going to follow Tesla and buy into Bitcoin? Yeah, so they've been doing it. I mean, Tesla is a very big company. Obviously, Elon Musk is Elon Musk, and um, he is pretty much a poster child of a fucking pumper. So again, mind my language, but ultimately, you know, many companies have already gotten in Bitcoin and crypto as part of their um, cash position, right? So if any company has positive cash flow or any, any kind of capital allocation method within the firm, then they probably already have done it. Don't expect every company to come out and, and announce it. Um, they're just not about that. Um, but you know what? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if many companies already have gotten in and have continued uh, uh, to hold uh, some form of crypto, whether it's Bitcoin or not, as part of their portfolio. Well, there you have it, guys. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Great questions tonight, to say the least. Absolutely phenomenal. And, you know, if you're not part of uh, of this uh, and part of Elite, you know, you owe it to yourself to to get in on this. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube now, uh, I highly recommend you check it out. We'll have the link down in the description. And uh, guys, we do this every week. Uh, so, you know, this is something that you can really benefit from you know, as far as your trading. And of course, then there's the community aspect as well. Uh, you know, being able to talk to Riz, myself, everybody else that we have in the analyst team is always very available to everybody. Uh, in our community and i would just highly recommend that you come and join us absolutely thanks chris um you know for for putting these on always great to be on and of course communicate and be a part of the the community i'm there every single day pretty much all hours of the day <laughs> um That's true. you know answering questions in fact many people call me a vampire <laughs> which i cannot uh confirm or otherwise, <laughs> but uh, you know what? It's it's fantastic. Something I put my heart and soul into, and I hope it shows. And of course, you know you and the team as well. So uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, you know whether you've watched this live with us, I appreciate you putting your time in, and, and especially those of you that have been with us in Elite and continue to be with us in Elite membership, uh, or if you've been watching the the recaps or the recordings and you're watching online, I appreciate that as well. Uh, you know, feel free to join us, join the community, see for yourself the, the difference that we're making. All right, guys. Well, just remember, no trading on Monday with the holiday. So in that case, we'll see everybody in Discord on Tuesday. Good night, everybody.